If you look up duck typing on wiki, you read the sentence, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it must be a duck. And while that sounds fantastic, it really does not help you to understand duck typing in Python. So, what is duck typing? In this video, you get the answer to that question and as a bonus, you will see how to give your objects superpowers by implementing magic methods. It turns out that Wiki has a second definition that makes much more sense. An object is of a given type if it has all methods and properties required by that type. But that needs some explanation as well, and I'll do that by showing you duck typing in action. Here is a string with the text hello. The string is printed. I execute the code, and here is the result. No surprises here. A string represents text, but a string is more. What happens when I print the length of a string? I execute the code, and Python shows the length of the string. Apparently, a string is also a kind of list object that can return its length. Now I ask the length of integer b. I execute the code, and this time Python gives an error. Notice the location of the error. It occurred in line 6. So, the program started normally and then crashed at line 6. And that already tells you something about duck typing. Python tries to use an object at runtime and raises an error when the operation is not supported. The emphasis is on trying and runtime here. It will try by searching for the operation in the object at runtime. If you are used to work with statically typed languages, this might seem strange to you. In this c -sharp code, the length of string A is printed. The compilation was successful and the program can be executed. But now the length of integer B is printed. The program cannot be compiled and it won't be executed. So there is a big difference between static typing and duck typing. In statically typed languages, the type of object is determined by its formal interface that you get from inheritance and defining public members in the class. With duck typing, an object is considered to be of a certain type when it behaves correctly when used. In statically typed languages, the problems occur at compile time. With duck typing, problems occur at runtime. At this point you might have the question, why would anyone prefer duck typing over static type checking? Well, first of all, there is no good or bad here. Both mechanisms have its pros and cons, just like everything else in software engineering. But I can show you a great application for duck typing in Python. For this, developer Dave will create a custom class. Here is class to do list. It takes and stores a list title and it creates an empty to do's list. Notice that the attributes are marked private and are not supposed to be accessed from outside of the class. Look at the UML class diagram. Since the to do's list is private, a method to create to do's needs to be added. So, method create to do is added to the class diagram. It's important to know that Python does not support formal interfaces. As you have seen, there is no compiler that checks for any type correctness when using this class. The only thing we can do is look at the class diagram and agree that an object is type compatible with a to do list when it supports these public attributes. But Dave forgets to add the createToDo method to the class. Now I create an instance of to-do list and create three to-dos. You know what will happen when I execute the code. Python gives an attribute error. The createToDo method does not exist. By using duck typing, Python was able to tell you at runtime that variable tl does not support operation createToDo. 
I ask Dave to fix the problem and he adds the create to do method. I execute the code and this time there are no errors. Variable tl is now type compatible with a to do list. So, duct typing works with custom methods as well. And now I can show you the beauty of Python when things are combined. The to-do list has a title and to-dos and from it I want to create a report like you see here. It shows a header with list name and length of the list, followed by the list items. But developer Dave brings his experience from C Sharp. So how would he support this in the to-do list class? The first thing that he needs to create is an accessor method for the list title. It returns the private title attribute. Then he creates a method that returns the list length. And to iterate the to-dos, the list also needs to be exposed by the class. I print the header and loop through the to-dos. I execute the code and that works. The output is correct, but there is a problem. Look at the class diagram. I add the three new methods. When I look at the methods, I notice something. This is not very Pythonic. For example, the length of a list is usually done by passing that list to the len function. Dave's class is not very intuitive for Python programmers. If I had to make an educated guess how to get the length of the to-do list, I assume I can just use the len function. So Dave, back to work. Dave renames getLength to dunderlen. This simple change allows me to ask for the to-do list length with the len function. Let me show you that that works. It does. So what happened here? I asked for the length of object tl, Python used duct typing and searched in the object for a method called dunderlen. It found the method and the method returned the length of the to-dos list. I expected to use the len function and it worked. The to-do list is now an object that has to-do logic and knows how to return its length. So what about iteration? It is my goal to get rid of the getToDo method and iterate the tl variable directly. Dave can support this by renaming getToDo's to dunderiter and convert the todos list to an iterator. I execute the code and that works. Since we are removing all the accessor methods, I could argue to also remove the getTitle method. I want to be able to just print the to-do list like this. Dave renames getTitle to dunderString. I execute the code and that works as expected. Now take a look at how beautiful this code is. The user of the to-do list class can make an educated guess on how to print and iterate to-do list objects. The to-do list is now a business object, but it is also a printable object and an iterable object. And for this, no interfaces were required. All Dave needed to do was to implement these magic methods. And with duct typing, Python checked at runtime if the object was type compatible with a to-do list. Now let me tell you there are many more special methods available in Python. And if you want to learn more about this, enroll in my Udemy course Python Objects with Special Methods. There you will find the most used special methods in Python. A link is in the description. And that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.